I suppose I saw most of him when he was the professor of poetry here at Oxford, giving wonderful lectures um, on all manner of things. Uh, the book called The Redress of Poetry is those lectures. And Heaney's prose should be paid attention to as well as his poetry because he's a wonderful prose stylist and one of the great critics, I think, of his generation. And he was talking about, you know, Robert Lowell, Elizabeth Bishop, John Clare, um, Dylan Thomas, a very memorable lecture on why Dylan Thomas doesn't quite cut it when you read it in middle age, um, as well as the Eastern European poets whom he loved so much, Brodsky, Herbert, um, Milos, Mandelstam. So the range and the power of his reference was extraordinary. He also gave of himself a lot to students and to friends and to, he was a great presence here in Oxford. What do you think made him a good critic? I think what made him a good critic was, well, what made him a good poet, a great poet, um, the ability to read inside things as well as outside them. And I, I often think the poets are people with one skin less than other people, you know, this absolutely extrasensory ability to touch and to feel the essence of, of what's going on. He, reading his criticism, is also very enlightening about his poetry when he fixes in on something that means a lot to him. I remember he, he loved a particular passage of Ivan Bolin's, I think, writing about Elizabeth Bishop, a poet they both um, love, and where she said that a poet's tone isn't something learned through a conscious craft, it's learned through a world of suffering. And I thought that's very, very true, that though there is this wonderful surface of Heaney's poetry, there, is a, there are worlds below it, and one of them is that world of suffering. And in a collection like Station Island, which is probably my personal favourite of his books, that is powerfully clear. Do you think he's a sympathetic critic in a way because he's a poet as well? I think he's a more sympathetic... He's a sympathetic critic as part of his poetic equipment, but it goes further than that. I mean, Patrick Kavanagh, whose work Heaney admired greatly and which meant a great deal to him, is, I think, an unsympathetic critic, uh, though a marvellous poet. And Heaney wrote a lot about Kavanagh and with a certain... A, he's very funny in the Stepping Stones book of interviews with Dennis O'Driscoll about his couple of meetings with with Kavanagh. Um, but he he liked what he called... This typical Seamus phrase, I think it's the airiness, scatter and sheer ordinariness that Kavanagh could Im, Im, impose on his poetry. And Heaney could do that too. But I think there's a kind of bitterness in Kavanagh's poetry which isn't there in Heaney's. I think the way Heaney takes into himself the world he came out of and then delivers it to us is one of his great gifts as a poet. And it's a gift to his readers. I think he does what, when you read Heaney's poetry over the years, as many of us have been doing, um, you get what you also get from Yeats and to a certain extent from Wordsworth, you, you, you grow with the poet. The poet is bringing you into his experience and you're growing with, with the poet in new ways. And part of that is, in fact, especially with Yeats, in casting back to, to one's youth. And that's why I think Heaney sits very comfortably in that great company. As he is comfortably at home increasingly in the world of classical literature and the, the great Greeks, and not only his adaptations of, of um, Greek literature, not only, of course, poetry, but drama, but also his, his passion for Greece itself. I think he was actually in Greece when he heard he, he got the Nobel Prize, I seem to remember. It's very much part of him is that uh, easy transposition into worlds of classical reference, worlds of contemporary Eastern European reference, worlds of American poetry, because, of course, he lived... Uh, part of the year and taught in, in Harvard and he, he, Robert Lowell is a great figure in his early life. He's written brilliantly about Frost. He's written about Elizabeth Bishop. So the, the, the net that's cast is enormously wide without ever compromising on or evading the roots in Mossbawn and Anna Horish, which are absolutely there and come through so often. And in the later books 
in the spirit level, in district and circle, in electric light, in um, especially in the very last book, Human Chain, the way he's looping back to childhood and youth and his parents and his family and elegy is, I think, very, very striking, especially now, sadly, um, that he's gone. I remember Seamus in many social occasions and at round dinner tables, encountering him on the street in Dublin, the great crinkly laugh, the, the warmth, the charisma, which he had in a very real sense, not in the kind of political science sense of charisma, but absolute magnetism. I think magnetism is the word I'd use. He was magnetic. I remember the wonderful occasions when he was here. I think Bernard O'Donoghue has talked about them too. The the parties he gave at Maudlin to celebrate his, his professorship. The way that he would talk to anybody and everybody in an intense and focused and thoughtful way. Uh, he was... You think of words like Vatic and Bardic and, you know, the words that go with the great poet. And he was a great poet and he looked like a great poet, like like Ted Hughes, you know, he looked like a poet. Uh, but he he never put on airs and he never got on a high horse. And that's what I remember about him most is the directness. And that's what's in the poetry as well, is that directness. And he, his enjoyment of life and his enjoyment of being here in, in Oxford was palpable, as his enjoyment with being with his family, whom he adored and who were the rock of his life, and his enjoyment of, of his enjoyment of everything. He was an enjoyer. He was a life affirmer and a life enhancer. <laughs> 